Welcome back to Coursera. This is lecture four in our continuing series of lectures about the anatomy of the upper limb. Last time we were talking about joints and the bones that make up joints, how they articulate in a synovial fashion, and we numbered the bones that make up the upper limb. And we also described what happens by definition when muscles cross a joint. So let's be a little more specific about how we arrive at descriptions of muscle attachments. We say, for example, that a typical skeletal muscle has an origin, a fixed point, and an insertion that's the movable point. And in this particular series of slides, they're shown in red and blue. So note, for example, our friendly biceps brachii that we spoke of last time. Now we see an illustration of its two heads, and note that the two heads are forming the origins, or the fixed point of the muscle, by attaching to two separate bony processes on the scapula, the so-called coracoid process of the scapula, and a region above the articulation between scapula and humerus called the supraglenoid tubercle then you can see the tendons of these two heads blending together, joining together, <clears throat> to form the fleshy belly of the muscle. And the fact that the insertion point, the more movable point, is down indicated by the area in blue. It's something called the radial tuberosity on the radius. So again, that's the insertion point, meaning that it's implying that the major action of the biceps is distally by acting to flex the forearm at the elbow. And you can't really see the reddened origin points. You can just see a hint of the tip of the coracoid process where the short head of the biceps has an attachment. You can't really see well the supraglenoid tubercle, but certainly it implies again that these are the origins. But the problem with this terminology is this. The biceps brachii, since it is also crossing the shoulder joint, must act at the shoulder joint. And actually, this muscle acts to flex at the shoulder joint. So in this particular case, the origin becomes the insertion, and the insertion becomes the origin. So anatomy texts are trying to get away from using this terminology by referring to these attachments because one could become the origin and one could become the insertion, and they could become interchangeable. The more common terminology now is to refer to the origin as the proximal attachment and refer to what used to be the insertion as the distal attachment. Then we get away from giving rise to a preconceived notion that one is more active or movable than the other. Because as we just said, since the biceps is crossing two joints, we can have the muscle act separately of those joints and have, obviously, different origins and insertions going forward. So we will pay some attention, logically, to the bony attachments of skeletal muscles in the upper limb, particularly as they give us an understanding of the joints that these muscles cross and, ultimately, the actions that occur at those joints. Now then, major topic of our conversation is next, and that is what or how do we define actions provided by muscles when they contract after crossing various synovial joints? And this again gets back to anatomic terminology. And again, we're using figures here to illustrate the changes in body position relative to the anatomic position and the definitions of the movements that occur in those planes. First off, let's look at the illustration at the top of the slide, because we're seeing an individual that's in the anatomic position, and she is moving body parts, the upper and the lower limbs, in the sagittal plane. Remember that the sagittal plane we basically had going through from front to back, basically through the body, in the midline through the nose. But what we're seeing now, if we generally speaking have movements that occur parallel to or in that sagittal plane, those movements are described as either being flexion or extension. Flexion or extension. 
generally speaking, flexion can be defined as moving a body part toward the anterior aspect of the body, generally speaking. That's one way of defining it. And certainly you can see here that the arm is moving in the anterior direction, in flexion, or here it's moving in the posterior direction or extension. But note that these actions are both occurring at the shoulder joint. So two of the actions possible at the shoulder joint will be flexion and extension of the arm. Another way of looking at flexion and extension is another way of defining flexion. Flexion can be defined by reducing the angle between two adjacent body parts by bringing, in this case, the two anterior body parts closer together and thereby decreasing the angle between them. So what's illustrated in that middle picture is flexion of the forearm at the elbow. There's the elbow joint. And we can see how the flexion decreases the angle between the arm and the forearm, whereas extension will increase the angle between arm and forearm when we move the forearm back to the anatomic position in the posterior direction. But the bottom line, as we can see, is that two of the actions possible at the elbow joint and at the shoulder joint will be flexion and extension. Then, if we move down to the wrist joint, down to the wrist joint, it's kind of a higher magnification view of it here, at the wrist joint, there's the wrist joint right there, we also have the ability to flex and extend our hand at the wrist. And when we flex our hand at the wrist, we're moving our palm, our surface of the hand forward, decreasing the angle between the palm of the hand and the anterior forearm. And we, when we extend or even hyperextend our hand at the wrist, we are moving our hand back into the anatomic position or hyperextending it as we see in the picture down here. So we have basically a series of joints basically at the area of the wrist that permit flexion and extension again. Then what about the thumb and the fingers? This is kind of an interesting little story. First off, when we flex our fingers, when you make a fist using your fingers, you are flexing your fingers again in the sagittal plane. And as you can see, when we roll our fingers up to make a fist, we can flex our fingers at a number of joints that are found between the metacarpals in the palm of the hand and the phalanges that make up the structural support of each finger. <clears throat> but then the other interesting point is when we flex and extend our thumb, we flex and extend our thumb, if you look basically down at the picture on the lower right corner, when you flex and extend your thumb, you're not flexing and extending your thumb in the sagittal plane, you're flexing and extending your thumb in the coronal plane. So the thumb actions of flexion and extension do not obey or do, do not occur in the same plane as flexion and extension of the digits. And obviously we're going to have to pay attention to that going forward as well. So a couple of other actions are illustrated on here, but they're obviously not just movements that occur in the sagittal plane, and we'll explore them going forward as we deal with specific joints. But our bottom line so far is simply to say, hey, generally speaking, except for the thumb, when you move a portion of the upper limb in the sagittal plane, generally speaking, you're flexing or extending that body part or at that joint at various points in the upper limb. Now then, how do we define movements that occur in the coronal plane? Well, here we basically have my friend up here at the top of the slide. And again, remember, we defined the coronal plane as forming an axis that arguably, or a plane that passed from one ear through the other ear. And if we move a body part parallel to that coronal plane, that's defined as being either abduction, abduction, or adduction, or adduction. So abduction is defined as movement of a body part, basically, away from the midline axis of the body. So when you abduct your arm, you're literally moving it away, basically, from a midline or a mid-sagittal plane that might run through the body's midline. 
when you adduct a body part, you bring it, you bring it medially or back closer to that anatomic plane that's running through the body part. So as you can see here, we have the ability to ab and adduct our arm at the shoulder. We don't perform ab and adduction at the elbow, but as we'll see in a moment, we do have the ability to ab and adduct our fingers when we finger spread. So by definition, we're going to be able to ab and adduct various body parts, various parts of the upper limb in the coronal plane. Then, what kind of actions occur in the horizontal plane? This is where we perform rotation. And again, at certain synovial joints in the upper, upper limb, we can undergo a rotation. And one of the ways of defining rotation is to take the anterior midline axis, for example, an axis running right through the anterior aspect of the upper, of the upper limb, and if we change the position of that, atlas, of that axis by rotating it toward the body, that's medial rotation, or if we rotate the midline axis running through the anterior aspect of the upper limb away from the body, that's considered to be lateral rotation. Regardless, these actions are occurring parallel to a hypothetical horizontal plane that might exist in various points through the upper limb or the body, respectively. So now, if we go back to the previous slide, we can extend our conversation about the fingers. Note that the fingers can be spread. You can spread your fingers, and you can bring them back together. But when you finger spread and bring them back together, that's considered to be an action that occurs in the coronal plane and would certainly be defined as ab or adduction. So we're going to be able to spread and adduct our fingers, bringing them closer together by adducting them and spreading them, increasing the gap between them. So this is an example in the picture down at the bottom of the slide of a fully adducted or fingers that have spread. But now what about the thumb? The thumb, again, doesn't obey the rule. Because we said already that the thumb is being, ab or ad the thumb is being flexed or extended in the coronal plane, and by the same token, when you abduct your thumb and adduct it back to the anatomic position, those actions are occurring in the sagittal plane. So the, again, the thumb basically is not obeying the rules by changing its position in planes and by definition that are perpendicular to the same actions that are defining finger movements. But again, our job basically is to find some, obviously, muscles that are performing those actions. Two more things. One is we will have the we do have the ability of taking the pad of the thumb and touching it to the pads, the anterior aspects of the skin covering the most distal part of each finger, and we call that movement opposition. So, as everyone knows, you can touch the pad of your thumb, do it now, to the pad of the pinky, and that's opposing your thumb. And then we need a muscle that will reposition the thumb back in the anatomic position as shown there. Lastly, we also have the ability of performing another series of actions that are really a form of rotation, but they're not defined as such, even though they occur in the horizontal plane. We have the ability, everyone knows this, of taking the palm of the hand that normally faces forward in the anatomic position and turning the palm so it faces posteriorly. And then we have an equal ability to return the palm to the anatomic position. Even though these are a form of rotation because they occur in the horizontal plane, they're defined as being pronation and supination pronation and supination, and as we'll see at some point, these actions are actually occurring at separate joints in the forearm between the radius and the ulna. So when we look at the position of the palm of the hand in the anatomic position, it is defined as being fully supinated, because the supinated position of the hand is one in which the palm of the hand faces forward. So this gives us a perspective during this lecture of how we define actions that occur in various planes when body parts 
and muscles contract the body parts at various synovial joints in the upper limb. Again, as a jumping off point of getting specific about what muscles are doing what going forward. Now that we've defined the axes about which skeletal muscles contract and move joints parallel to the plane of those actions, we can see an example on our slide now from the digital atlas of the arm being abducted at the shoulder and it identifies at least initially the major muscle which is performing that, performing that action and it's the middle fibers of the deltoid and certainly note that the deltoid is not only an abductor that's its major action but the anterior and the posterior fibers are also capable of a deduction adduction but that is also an action that's going to be performed by additional muscles lastly let's look at the upper limb, particularly the arm, as it is being laterally or medially rotated at the shoulder. You can see during our motion atlas here that there's medial rotation and there is lateral rotation. Note that both medial and lateral rotation are being performed in part by the anterior or the posterior fibers of the deltoid muscle, but particularly lateral rotation is also being performed by a pair of rotator cuff muscles that I'm highlighting individually and we'll talk extensively about those rotator cuff muscles and their clinical significance a bit later on.